Good evening, my name is Mark Tribe. I'm the chair of the MFA Fine Arts Department at SVA. And tonight it's my pleasure to welcome Suzanne Bocanegra, a visual artist whose recent work employs the performing arts, specifically theater and dance, to investigate and explore things like 15th century tapestries, like this one here, and 19th century paintings, for example, by uh, Georges Seurat. Some of Suzanne's performances take the form of artist lectures in which actors such as Lily Taylor and Francis McDormand speak Suzanne's words as she reads them into a microphone that transmits her voice into their ear. Interesting then tonight that she'll be giving us an artist lecture. Suzanne also makes video installations, often related to the performative works, sculptures, paintings, and collages that are exhibited in museums and galleries. And Suzanne is also an accomplished costume designer. Her work has been presented and exhibited in solo exhibitions and their theatrical and performative equivalents at, for example, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the Wexner Center at Ohio State University in Columbus, the Fisher Center at Bard College, in upstate New York, the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University, the Kitchen, MPAC, this large performing arts center at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, uh, in upstate New York, Mass MoCA, the Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis, the Crowley Theater in Marfa, Texas, the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, the Henry Museum in Seattle, the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, the Tang Museum at Skidmore College, this little museum in Midtown called the Museum of Modern Art, uh, where one of her works received its world premiere, Site Santa Fe, Judson Church, the famous and very important Judson Memorial Church in the West Village, uh, right in the Greenwich Village on um, Washington Square South, the Blanton Museum of Art at UT Austin, uh, Bowery Poetry Club, uh, a really important venue for poetry readings uh, in the East Village, the Queens Museum, uh, Art Cake in Brooklyn. I think it was the premier uh, event or performance at, at Art Cake, and uh, James Cohan Gallery, among many, many other venues. Suzanne's most recent performance, called Honor, an artist lecture by Suzanne Boken Negra, starring Lily Taylor was commissioned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and will travel in the near future to LA MOCA, ICA Boston, and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Suzanne has received grants and awards from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts, which is really one of the premier uh, funders in the performing arts for serious contemporary uh, dance, performance art, and theater. The Guggenheim Foundation, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, McDowell, Yado, NIFA, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, the Mid-Atlantic Arts Council, which is sort of like NISCA for uh, Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, um, maybe Pennsylvania. I don't know if it exists anymore either. I was on it. I was sure once. Yeah. Um, and then also the Pollock Krasner Foundation. Um, that's a pretty blockbuster list for what it's worth. Um, Suzanne's work has been reviewed or discussed in the New York Times, the New Yorker, Art Forum, October, Art Papers, Art in America, the Brooklyn Rail, Hyperallergic, the LA Times, Bomb, the Wall Street Journal, Issue with two U's and two S's. Uh, Glass Tire and Adobe Airstream, which are two really terrific arts publications. Uh, I guess one is a podcast uh, out of Texas, um, maybe in relation to your work at Site Santa Fe. Uh, yeah, The Village Voice, New York Magazine, Art Journal, The Boston Globe, and Time Out New York and Time Out London. Suzanne has taught at Parsons, at Middlebury College, and at the Cooper Union. She received a Master's of Fine Arts from the San Francisco Art Institute and a Bachelor's of Fine Arts 
from the University of Texas at Austin. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Suzanne Bocanegra. All right, uh, hello, my name is Suzanne Bocanegra. I'm an artist and I live in New York. That's what I always say at the beginning of these pieces. But um, uh, I've been, um, when was it, probably about 10 years ago, maybe a little more than 10 years ago, I, I did my first um, artist lecture but as a theatrical performance. And uh, since that time, uh, I've done four of them. Uh, the last one I premiered a couple of weeks ago at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, the first three were all, they all came from personal stories. That's where I started. And, um, but this last one, they asked me to pick a work of art uh, in the museum's collection. And I picked this. It's, it's actually huge. It's um, probably, I don't know, six times this. It, it's uh, 69 characters, and they're all demonstrating the concept of honor. And let's see what I have. They're all labeled, so you can uh, know who they are. I knew nothing about the 16th century. I didn't know anything about um, tapestry, um, although I've always loved um, I've always uh, loved the idea of tapestry and the idea of weaving and um, and fiber crafts, but really I didn't know anything about all of this. Um, I picked it because I figured there's 69 people in here and they're all labeled like this one's Deborah, and I figured there's bound to be some interesting stories these people have. So if I get stuck, I can just tell their stories. Um, the way that I've been doing, it's kind of developed over the years, but now I kind of have a format that's set. Um, I read my lecture into a microphone. It goes into this little device that is in the actor's ear and the actor hears what I say and then they repeat after me and perform what I just said. Um, this is Lily Taylor. And there you can see me. There you can see me. Um, and these these lectures that I do, um, they're kind of they kind of end up being uh, more like essays, and they wander all over the place. And it goes um, from just me musing on what the word tapestry means and and how it's used in our culture to um, let's see what's next. Oh, to the actual history of this particular tapestry. This is the guy who owned it. His name is Gerard de Lamarck. He was a prince bishop in Liège um, in the 1500s. And um, I couldn't find much about it. Everything about it was written in, in um, Flemish. And so, and I don't speak Flemish. I, could, I barely find anything about it, but I did go to Liège and I found this incredible um, bird duro or amour, whatever that he owned. But, uh, but all of these lectures, they kind of meander all over the place. I don't even know why I had, oh, I was talking about joyous entries. The other thing that's really interesting about this particular tapestry that I found out was that um, it, um, it shows uh, an early form of theater. Before they had theaters like we have now, um, they would do joyous entries. So there were, um, when a, a ruler came to power, they would stage this kind of parade sort of thing and the ruler would be costumed and it would be scripted. And then along the route of the town, all the different guilds would mount stages and they would do Tableau de Bont. So I don't know if you know Tableau de Bont, but it's where they, people get costumes and they just stand still. So years ago, I, I saw in an airline magazine this an advertisement, I guess, for Pageant of the Masters in Laguna Beach, which is a big Tableau of the Bonnet show that they do now, and they recreate things for the art. So it was great to used to go see that. Oh, that's one of their Tableau of the Bonnet. Um, I talked a lot about the 16th century, uh, Renaissance Fair, uh, experimental theater, weaving and craft. 
and and just the the look and the aesthetic of a weaving because it has to be done on a grid so there's a really peculiar way that that the weavers would render like shading and um, it's it's quite beautiful this is the very first i guess you would call it the enterprise lecture that i did this is at the performing garage that's what paul's are it's called when a priest marries a witch and uh I was just asked to give an artist talk at Museum of Modern Art, and I always wanted to tell the story about how I became an artist and um, this wacky thing that happened in my Catholic church in Pasadena, Texas, which is a really working class area by all the oil refineries in Texas, and um, and how this scandal that happened in my church made me want to become an artist. And so after I put everything together for Kind of telling that story, I realized it was a story, and I wanted somebody who was a really good storyteller to present it. So I asked my friend Paul Lazar, who was like, um, he's an amazing actor. Actually, he's going to be um, in Macbeth on Broadway in a couple of weeks, but um, and he's super funny, right? So like, I can say something, and it just it's just flat, but he can say it, and he had everybody hysterically laughing. So he was, he was actually the, the perfect person to, to have my first experience with an actor. So um, what happened was we, we did it at the Museum of Modern Art and uh, it worked as a piece really, as a theater piece. And so we started doing it at small theater festivals. These are just different places that we were performing it at. Oh, and then we, were, we performed it at this little theater festival at CUNY, and then uh, Frances McGorman was there with her husband Joel, and really liked it, and took us out for beers afterwards. And somehow I had other stuff to say. I have another story I'd like to tell about wearing a body cast as a teenager. And she said, Oh, I'll do that. And she looked at Paul and she said, And you're going to direct. So that, uh, then we went from there. Uh, this is the, and this, um, the first one, when the priest marries, which I just kind of threw it together really fast. Um, there was no director. I didn't know what a director did. I didn't know any of that stuff. And Paul did it because he was my friend, right? And we ended up using the in-air thing because he only had a day to spend on it. He didn't have time to memorize it. And in the Wooster group, I don't know if you know that it's a downtown experimental group. Uh, Liz LeCompte uses um, the in-air thing. She's been using it for years, but she uses it in a very different way. She, as I understand it, she doesn't like people to, she doesn't like her actors to act. She wants to mess them up. So she is feeding them the text uh, in such a way where they don't have time to perform it. They have to just spit it out. And that's the kind of performance that she wants and what she's looking for. And she uses it for all kinds of reasons, but Paul was just using it because he didn't have time to memorize it. But then it ended up becoming this really interesting, um, when we first performed it, my voice was in the room on loudspeaker talking along to him. Um, then it's developed over the years. Anyway, but this was, then I started learning about theater. We workshopped it at the Armory. Um, we performed it, bam, and it went around different places. This one, I added uh, demonstrations of different pieces that I've done over the years. Um, and I also talk not just about my own personal experience with body cast, but the whole idea of um, casting um, ancient Greek and Roman sculpture and how that was a part of people's education. Um, I was exposed to that stuff uh, when I went to UT. We, it was all locked up in the tower, the big tower that was at UT, and one of the TAs took us there to just look at all this amazing sculpture because it's 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 cast directly from the real thing. So it's, it can be really impressive, but it's plaster, which is so beautiful. Let's more of that. Oh, and also there's like all of this cast porn. I had no idea. So, I mean, there, people are really into all this cast porn. Uh, this is the end of the show. This is um, a singer, uh, Theo Blackman, who's singing a piece that I did called Color Chart. Um, next one was Farmhouse Whorehouse. By that time, it had kind of developed where I'm on stage two, rather than having my voice in 
in the hall, uh, talking along with the actor. Now I'm I'm visually present on the stage, and that's uh, kind of works better because it's easier for the audience to kind of they understand what's going on, but because they can see it. But um, my voice doesn't interfere with the actor's voice. Um, the next story was Farmhouse Whorehouse. It's about my grandparents' farm in LaGrange, Texas. That's my grandma. That's my grandpa. Uh, and this, this very famous whorehouse was across the street. So um, the piece talks about, oh, that's my mom. Uh, it talks about this very you know, personal story about the life but, that they were living, but um, but also I meandered into all kinds of things because my first, ex I didn't come from an art, arty family or know much about any of that stuff, but uh, I started seeing impressionist, French impressionist paintings and I thought they were pretty. So that was my kind of first exposure to art and I had no idea that, you know, all those women were prostitutes and I didn't really understand what I was looking at at all. So um, I talk about that kind of, those kind of ideas and also um, the whole mystique of this warehouse. It's very famous in Texas. that was across the street. So there, that's Sheriff Florney. He was a sheriff in town and uh, he was in cahoots with the chicken ranch. Oh, it, it ends with this piece that I did um, with Shara Nova. She's a, a singer. Uh, she goes by My Brightest Diamond, and she's also a composer. So I asked her to compose a song that was based on a couple of things that my grandmother used to say over and over. My grandmother had Alzheimer's, so she would say the same things over and over again. And so Shara made this really beautiful song out of the piece. Out of my grandma's, what grandma said. Now, this is a piece I haven't thought about in a while. Uh, it's called Chromatic. I taught this class. Let's see if you can see that. Oh, yeah. I taught this class with Susan Marshall. She's a choreographer. And Jason Trudy, he's a percussionist and a composer. And uh, we taught this multidisciplinary class at Princeton. And at the end of it, Susan said, oh, I think we should all do a piece together. And this is kind of I, out of my comfort zone. I, mean, I didn't really know, because we decided we were all going to perform too. And Susan is uh, an amazing choreographer, but she hasn't performed since she was a teenager. And Jason performs all the time, but we never worked together. And, and I, I went to come up with a kind of a, we sort of threw around a lot of different ideas about what to do our piece about. And so we ended up uh, starting with Joseph Albers' uh, color theory book, because I figured that that was broad enough to bring in a lot of different things and abstract enough that we could all somehow relate to it. Um, so here, they're both really beautiful movers. And I, my role was kind of, I was off to the side, like I usually am, and talking every now and then. So kind of the structure of the piece ended up being a lecture demonstration with more demonstrating than lecture, really. But we played around with a lot of different sound ideas. And um, uh, this is, and, and also kind of going back through the history of what people have thought about color. I mean, there's these all. Whole, all idea, uh, these ideas about color organs that have been invented by several different people. And um, there's been many people over the years who've developed these theories about how certain colors emit certain sounds. So uh, this was a section where we're demonstrating the different sounds of different colors. Oh. This was to run, and, and another very important part of this piece was uh, Eric Southern, who was the lighting designer, and Jeff Larson, who was the video designer, because there were so many things that you could do with color. And in fact, I don't have an image of this, but the way the whole show ended was we took out red, yellow, and blue, and then Eric just did these weird things with lights on the red, yellow, blue, and you would see them change. It was, it was really beautiful. Oh yeah, that's um, that's another Eric thing going with the lights and then 
Jason is a perfectionist, so he's he's really coordinated. So he ended up doing this amazing dance. Um, after that, I was thinking about since I had taken this artist lecture and sort of um, applied all these different um, things that people in theater do to it, um, different techniques. Um, I was thinking of other things, other ways that artists present themselves. And I thought about a studio visit. So I was experimenting with how to theatricalize a studio visit. So I did this performance for a while. It was just for one, two, three people at a time. Um, this is at my studio at the Can Factory in Brooklyn. And this is act one, which started with um, me doing kind of a slideshow on this iPad. And then the rest of my studio, I just kind of piled everything I owned into this big mess and then had it lit. And then there was a soundtrack. And then I kind of go around and collect different random things from it and just done the stuff. And then uh, Act 3 is in another small room. And I take 10 of the objects, and I talk just off the top of my head about them for one minute. And um, I have my head that times me. Well, actually, I was going to time myself here, because I never, I'm not good with time. Um, so basically, I'll, I would start talking about something, and then my head would say, why? And so I needed to put that aside and go to the second one. And then there was a live feed video monitor. I don't really have a slide of it, but it was basically it would create a collage as I would go along up above my head. Oh, yeah, kind of like that. I just keep adding stuff to it. But it was projected on, and which looked really different. Um, than the actual thing. Uh, I was trying to figure out, I mean, there's several different reasons I got into this, I think. I, I just found this image the other day, I really liked it. And it's all these women, you know, spinning and weaving. And I've always liked that, that whole world, um, this fantasy world I had about, um, working with textiles. And so I took this Swedish weaving workshop where you go away, you stay there for a couple of weeks and they teach you all this stuff about how to weave these elaborate um, Swedish patterns on looms. I really hated it. I had no idea that, I mean, it's kind of boring stuff, but I love, I love the apparatus, you know? I just love, I love this stuff. And, um, so anyway, I got back and I, I found this Annie Albers weaving that she, she did. I can't remember, I think this is like from the 30s. And she, it's really big, it's like, maybe it's like four by six feet. And um, so I thought, well, I like to draw. So I, I drew this over and over and I, um, all different sizes. And I, I thought of it as kind of analogous to the whole idea of, uh, of weaving, but something that I actually enjoyed doing. And then after I finished them all, I sort of arranged them into this giant kind of floppy tapestry. I did a couple of them. I also did smaller ones too, but uh, now I put that, oh, here's a close up. Let me see what's next. Oh, okay. So, uh, so I was really into these weaving things, and I was drawing these weavings in my studio. And uh, my husband's a composer, and and if you look at weaving notation, it's done on a five line staff, just like music is written. So I took some of the books home and I asked him if, if he could sing them and interpret them, and you can't, you can't, and it's it's. Uh, it's a lot like minimal music. And so I just kind of had that floating around in my head, like, oh, that's interesting that you can take this, that notation and turn it into music. Um, 
Meanwhile, I went to this dinner party and I ended up sitting, the only seat available was next to this one with them. It really drives me nuts kind of. And so I was like, oh, oh I'm gonna. And, uh, but then we ended up talking and she told me about this, um, this grant that she had just gotten. And it was a grant by the Danish government and it was only gonna be for three years. And it had to be uh, New York artists. It couldn't even be just American. It had to be New York artists. And they had to collaborate with somebody Danish. And she was telling me you know, how she did it. And I was thinking, and it, and it was a very generous grant. And I was thinking, you can get that? I'm applying. And so I, I applied and I got it. And then I had to find somebody Danish to, um, to, to do the piece with. And my husband kind of knew this guy who's a Danish accordionist, which ended up being perfect. And so I had still had this idea of weaving, turning it to music. And so uh, I ended up doing, and I, I'm, I'm telling you this story because this is, this is kind of one of the ways that I jumped from doing drawings in my studio to doing performance. So, like I said, this grant was super generous. They gave me money to go to Denmark and look around at stuff. So I was in some little town and I, I had a bad camera, and I found, it was a historical, I want to say recreation, but it wasn't recreation. It was just preserved little cottage. And it had this fabric all through it. And it's called Omer Duck. And um, it's just a traditional kind of stripe pattern. And I, I, I really thought it was beautiful. So I thought, well, I'm gonna somehow go with that. And um, let's see what I got. Okay, so I ended up doing this piece. I decided to, um, I found this uh, woman, Gail Godnick, who um, very generously, and she, she's, a, she's in the fa fashion world. And, uh, but she also loves weaving. And so she had all these looms at her house. And so she, she's set up um, over there with a floor loom and she's weaving that um, traditional Danish pattern. And there are microphones connected to her loom. So, and you know, looms, it's like an organ, they have those um, pedals. And so it made this really great percussive sound. Meanwhile, Froda, He's the Danish person that ended up uh, collaborating with. And he is playing the accordion, but he, he's playing the same pattern that she's weaving. And then I decided um, there's another part of the weaving notation, and that's the thread count. And it's just a, a number pattern. And so I thought, well, it would be interesting to somehow work that into the whole situation. And so I got 50 of my friends who've never played violin before, and I rented violins. And uh, I had this by Todd Reynolds, um, like an hour or two before the performance, taught them uh, how to play on the open strings. And then he conducted them and would tell them, and he just, they learned very simple kind of um, commands. And uh, he conducted the whole performance. And well, not, not um, the weaver and the queerness, but he conducted the violinist. And so what you don't see is he's back here and he's also lit. So, and the audience is in the middle. And so it's kind of a four-sided performance. And this is my first experience ever working with a lighting designer. And I, I wanted the lighting designer to, to make it kind of dark and scary. Um, it was Laura Mazakowski. I don't know what I'm saying her name wrong. Anyway. That's a Judson, yeah. But you know, uh, well, Judson Church is it's still uh, very active, I think. I think there's still the Judson Church, um, some sort of activity there. I forgot the name. Anyway, back in the, I guess, late 60s and 70s, people like Yvonne Rayner and Deborah Hay and um, Sally, I'm not remembering Sally's last name. Anyway, 
I think Robert Rauschenberg was involved, and of course, Steve Paxton. All these people were experimenting with um, these uh, different ideas about dance, and they were experimenting with um, just pedestrian movement. And uh, they ended up at Judson Church because Judson Church donated their space to them. And a lot of these performances became really legendary. So there's still uh, there's still dance concerts that are held there, and some really interesting. Is it called the Judson Church? It is. I don't know what it's called, but I mean Judson Church is still called Judson Church, but there's a group uh, that still do really experimental dance. It's kind of uh, grounded in that whole idea of things that happened in the 60s and 70s, but some of it's really interesting. And I've gone to it quite a bit, and why can't I remember the name of it? I did see a Devon Rader performance there like 15 years ago. Uh -huh. a long time. Just uh -huh. an interesting place with this. I, I just thought it was interesting that he did this performance there because of the history of the venue in particular and the way in which this transition from modern dance into contemporary dance kind of happened partly there. Yeah, and, and you know, it's famous for, for those ideas about dance. And I wanted to do it there partly because of the history, but partly because it's such a beautiful space and they cleared out all of their cues and everything. So it's kind of ready to go. And, and they're used to do a performance. So um, I just can't remember. Anyway, let me just keep going. Well, I, I hate that the, the title is, is on there, but oh, you're trying to turn it down? Um, and I performed that piece. It, I, I've toured that to different places. And we were going to do it uh, like two years ago, but then the pandemic happened. And it's really hard to get pieces for people. And so it's hard to get Frodo over. And also, um, now at this point, I work with um, Einar Canting. He's the, I guess you call it DJ. He mixes the sound live. Uh, and I, I feel like I can't do it without them. So it's really hard for people to get visas now just to perform. This is uh, another performance I did right after that. It's called I Write the Songs. And it was commissioned by the Drawing Center. So it had to have something to do with drawing. And this is at the World Financial Center. Um, let me see this one. We'll play the valor. What you're hearing is the flex string quartet. And what they're doing is people are drawing. I, I got all this music paper from different libraries and from material for the arts. And then I had these tables made with drawing materials and the music paper. And people would come up during the day, they would draw on them. Then it would go on a clothesline to the stage and be put on the, uh, their music stand. And then you could see what the drawing was because it was a lively thing to the um, to monitor below each player. And uh, the Bloodsburg Quartet, they're very experimental and, and really talented. And so they would look at what was given to them and then they'd interpret it. 
And and sort of, I mean, a string quartet, they played together for years, so they also know how to blend their sound. And it, it lasted for like six hours. Let's see. Oh, and this is the, the this is the last stage. After it was performed, they would go back on the clothesline to the booth, and um, um, I had volunteers um, from this place in that town. It's called the Art of the Bookmaking, and they would take every twenty scores and they would bind them. And it's actually really interesting to watch them and how they would hand bind the different scores. But I didn't expect, I mean, both of these pieces, uh, we remember and I write the songs, you can't rehearse them. They're, they're kind of like putting together, well, making my own recipe and kind of baking a cake and just hoping it turns out okay, because there's no way to rehearse that. Um, and luckily it did, but as opposed to the the, um, the other pieces that I showed you, the artist lectures and chromatic, and those are very rehearsed. Um, I was going to show you some of the costumes that I've been making. This is um, for Big Dance Theater. It was a piece by Sybil Kimson called It Curvis Geist. It was originally performed at the Chocolate Factory, then at a uh, dance theater workshop. And a lot of the costumes I make there, I just kind of cobble a lot of old costumes together that I buy in thrift stores and different places. Sometimes I make new things. Uh, this was a, a Another piece by Sybil, it's called Now Let Us Pray Susan Sontag. And um, I had this idea of having the actors carry their set, kind of like, um, like they were peddlers. Um, this particular character, he's, um, he's a photographer. And so there's a scene where he has to be in the dark room. And that's his dark room. This was for uh, Antigone, that's uh, Creon, uh, Creon's son. Is it Haman? I can't remember. This is the chorus. One person was the chorus. Um, I started making costumes uh, for my lectures. So here's Lily in one of those. Um, and this is a, an installation I did at the Fabric Workshop. And since I've been making costumes, I wanted to see what would happen if you just had the costumes in the set for a particular piece and what kind of read you would get off that. Um, this is the costumes in the set for La Fille Malgarde, which is um, 18th century ballet. And it said that it's one of the first ballets, you know, formal ballets. It's a French ballet about um, a, a girl who runs off with her her boyfriend, basically. And um, it's all, it's one of those things that I, I just really loved all the imagery in it because it's all these peasant outfits. And uh, there's this really great scene in the middle of the ballet where the mother who always, Usually it's always portrayed by a man and because it's kind of a comic role and has usually has a huge bonnet. And uh, there's a scene where um, they, they do this whole dance on point, but in wooden clogs. It's kind of beautiful. And it's got all this stuff that I love. And, and every, every uh, choreographer interprets it in, this, in a different way. But um, so I, I started with that idea of that particular ballet and doing costumes for it and doing a set for it. So I had this, these flats made like traditional theatrical flats.
So I love ballet shoes too. Um, this is uh, part of that same show, but on a different floor, a different installation It's Dialogue of the Carmelites. Uh, Dialogue of the Carmelites. It's a opera by Palenque. It's like, I think from 1956 or something. And it's about these French nuns during the revolution. And um, basically the big climax is they all go to the guillotine and get there. That's chop it off. And it's, it's, that's the best part of the opera. And because they're all singing in a big, huge chorus and one by one, they go up and they get their head chopped off and the sound gets less and less and less. It's kind of, that's the best part of it. Um, so I had found this book, it's, um, wait, I think I have a picture of the cover. Yeah, it's a guide to the Catholic Sisterhood of the United States. And it's from the same time period as the opera. And it, it has, on each page, it has a different order of none um, that you could join. And, and all the pages are set up in the same way. Let's see if I have that. Um, where it would tell you the qualifications, uh, it would tell you what the habit was, and it would tell you where to write if you were interested. And like I was, I was so amazed by it because it's it's the mid fifties, but they would they would have these things like, uh, well, you can see that this one on the left, it's like a small dowry is required, or some would say, um, you know, you couldn't be over a certain age or um, you couldn't have any handicaps. You couldn't be disabled in any way. Um, you couldn't be of illegitimate birth. You had to prove that you were. I mean, it's like, it really felt medieval. And of course, look at their outfits, right? It's from the 16th century. So, and I've always loved those outfits. I mean, I grew up going to Catholic school and I, I wanted to be a nun for the longest time just because I love those outfits so much. <laughs> And um, so this was my big opportunity, and I, I, I basically costumed the pages. So with the help of the fabric workshop, they're all embroidered, or they're like something is added to them sometimes. I mean, you can kind of see in these. Um, yeah, there's a good one. And so they're all laid out, and the room's kind of dark. And then there's a soundtrack, this uh, really great singer and composer, Caroline Shaw, is singing um, When I'm Alone. And uh, I had my husband, I wanted him to do some sort of take on Dialogue of the Carmelites. He's Jewish and he hates all that stuff. So I couldn't get him to do that. So we ended up on this kind of compromise where he he typed in when I'm alone, and then it's it's um, it's the sentence is completed. And because these women are never alone, they live in community for their entire life. And so when you come into the space, you see uh, the women, you see these pages and their costume, and then you hear this uh, soundtrack. Oh, and this is, so I, I can't remember how I found this, but I must have been looking for particular kinds of costumes and I found this, I'll just play you with this. It's Judy Garland's um, border test for Valley of the Dolls. If you talk to me, I'll... Sound take 833. Thank you. All right, I'll <laughs> you want to, should we see the back? Sure. Yeah, would you turn around, Judy, please? Huh? I'll turn around. Always. Without a cigarette and a blindfold. Oh, that's like great. That's nice. Turn all the way around. That's lovely. Anyway, it's about four minutes long. She, it's just a technical film that shows four of her glamorous outfits. Um, I mean, she has an incredible life story. She's this amazingly talented woman who was exploited her whole life. And at this point, um, she was 
she was cast in Valley of the Dolls because one of the characters is based on her life, but no one would hire her at this point because she's in such bad shape. Um, and you can even see it's if you watch this um, wardrobe test, it's really kind of painful. Like even she goes, oh, with that with a cigarette and a blindfold. I mean, like she's you can feel there's something about her that's very vulnerable. And um, so I decided to recreate that wardrobe test, and I got eight different performers, very strong women. Uh, who are not vulnerable, and they're from somewhat different uh, areas of performance. And we recreated the wardrobe test as exactly as possible. I, they're listening to Judy and they're ear repeating, and I had a, um, a movement coach work with them, so we got the movements um, as close as we possibly could. And it's all synced up. So. I mean, my idea was that they became like a Greek chorus and sort of um, in some ways um, honoring this really tragic story of this really amazing woman. And uh, this was done with the fabric workshop and they, I mean, we even like recreated the, ca the carpet, the whole thing. And the, the piece is a, it's a little over four minutes and it just loops. I don't know what's next. I thought, I'm, oh, well, I'll, I'll just end with this piece. This is kind of out of order. It's from probably about 10 years ago and it's called Little Dot and I, I've always loved this Seurat painting. It's very tiny, it's only this big. It was in my hometown museum in Houston. And as a teenager, I just always loved it. And I always would think, what would happen if all the dots fell to the floor? And what if you find to sort them all? I don't think that way anymore, but I, because now I go, ah. But then I thought that would be so much fun. So anyway, I made a chart and I counted all the dots and I divided them in categories as opposed to like, like the frame or the hair and what different colors were, were part of each, um, each object on the painting. And then I thought, okay, well, I have this chart, now what am I going to do with it? So I had it for a long time. I couldn't figure out what the heck. And I decided to make it into a ballet because I've always loved point shoes and they basically, you know, they, they make the sound that is kind of a, a direct sound that's from hitting a stage. And I, I basically was attempting to make that chart into a ballet. So I had a stage that's roughly the shape of the woman. Um, I put these uh, poles of the, I think it's 16 different colors that were uh, part of the painting. And then the, the numbers of, of how many times those dots appeared and on what, um, on what area of the painting. And then uh, this whole stage is uh, wired for sound. So, and, and it's, um, it's got all this reverb on it. So whenever the dancer is, is um, doing the beret movement, which is also a movement that I really love. Like it's it's the movement, God, I can't remember the name of the dancer, but in the 19th century, she invented it because it was supposed to look like she was a fairy flying um, through the air. But of course it doesn't. It looks like she's doing this, which is still really cool because she's on tippy toe. And I thought that was kind of really uh, a good analogy for Seurat because there was all this theory with Seurat that, that all these dots were blending in your eye and they were more realistic than if they used, he used the painting techniques that had been used for centuries. But that's not true at all. I mean, they still remain dots. And, and it's a really quirky and nutty idea of how the world should be rendered. And that's why we love it so much, because it's so crazy. And so, um, so I kind of wanted to combine those two crazy things. 
And uh, the piece takes a long time. It takes 12 hours to perform. I'm going to end there. Thank you guys. And now you guys are supposed to ask questions. You know, I have to confess, I never ask questions at these things. I hate doing that. I just hate it. I don't know why. I just, I've always been that way. So, oh, there you go. Thank you, the question. Uh, I was curious, um, do you have a weaving practice now? What? Do you have a weaving practice now? No, no. I, I found out by, you know, immersing myself in it. I don't really like it that much. Um, I mean, I like the idea of it and I like looking at it. I like, I like all the paraphernalia and I like all of the history of it because it's been around. It's, I mean, Penelope, you know, and it's ancient Greek and there's uh, the, the three fates, you know, they spin and then they cut it and you die. Oh, I mean, it's, it's so embedded in everything. And it was such a part of people's everyday life for hundreds and hundreds of years. But um, I don't know, I just, I'd rather draw. Thank yeah. you. Uh, did John Cage like influence your sound practice in any way? Uh, well, I love his work and I follow it, um, but not not directly. No. Yeah, he's much smarter than I am. I think he's, I mean, his work is really good. Yeah. Would you ever be curious to do a restage? I restage them all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, they do change. Like, for example, we remember the moment with the violins, the way it changed, well, we get a, we don't travel with the weaver, we get a local weaver. Uh, so I guess that changes, but really what changes is we discuss before the piece how Einar is gonna mix the sound, because he's mixing the sound of the violins, the, the loom and the um, accordion. And sometimes he can, input. there was one, when we were in Marfa, I thought it was really interesting what he did, but I don't think I wanted him to do it again, but it was nice to hear that one time where he emphasized the sounds of the audience and he mixed that in. And, and so that's kind of interesting. It's always a little different. And then um, with the lectures, because the actor never has the lecture memorized, she's always, she or he is always listening to me. I, I change it all the time. I mean, because also when you hear it, you realize, oh, that line, that, that line's not quite right. I think I can, or maybe I'm gonna take that out and put something else in. And um, these actors are also good at, at just, you know, doing it on the fly. Like even with Lily, the day we did uh, Honor, usually you do a dress rehearsal the day of the piece. I changed it between the dress rehearsal and the piece, and I never told her. She didn't care. You know, it's just like she's listening and she just does it. And also there's there's often a time where um, the actor, it just happens naturally. It's never not happened where they, they don't quite hear me or it just is muffled or something. And so usually there's uh, something uh, during the performance where we stop and the actor says, what'd you say? I, I can't hear you. And um, then we found out over the years that that's usually the audience's favorite part. They all say, did you plan that? That was so, yeah. And, but it's, it's never planned, it just happens. But the good thing about it happening is that uh, it reinforces uh, what's going on between the two of us, that she's performing me. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question from the chat. Uh, Addison asks, Suzanne, thank you for your talk. As someone working with research as a process that is so close to the surface of your own work, how do you approach or think about archiving your research or in general? Is that important to you? 
Oh, I think all of this work comes out of the fact that I love hanging out in libraries. I mean, it's that's where I get all my ideas. And the best thing in the world, I've always done that. But I've never really, honestly, until I started doing these artist lectures, I never had a way to interpret what I find in libraries into, um, into my art in the same direct way. So um, having access to a really good library is super important for all these pieces, for all the lecture pieces. And, you know, it's just so wonderful to meander around a library and it's not, you're going after a book that you saw in the, in the catalog, but it's usually the book, you know, 10 books down, that's the one that really hits you and gives you the information that you want. And that hunt is really exciting. I get another question for the process. Um, it's very inspiring to see an artist that goes through so many different mediums and um, approaches different themes in different ways. How, how do you decide, how do you approach the project? Do you like think of the theme first and then decide which medium to do the work? Well, with the lectures, it first started because I'd always wanted to tell this particular story about my church and how that made me an artist. I thought, oh, it's now or never. It's, this is, you know, I'll do it for this. And then I realized after that that I had two other stories I wanted to tell, the body cast as a teenager and my grandparents' farm. And uh, this last piece was the first one that started not with the person's story. It, and I didn't know if it was going to work or not because I was, I started with a piece of art that I, I really didn't know much about. And, um, but it ended up being really interesting, you know? Thank God for libraries too. You can find out so much about the 16th century and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I, um, I wonder, there's a lot of, uh, like mechanics to your work, whether like technically or even conceptually, you make a lot of decisions. And I, I'm curious, are they like intuitive or do you go through a catalog or like tons of like the internal catalog and personal of like ideas and how many do you like scrap and how many do you go with? Like, or do you, you just trust, like, you're in, or is it into it? You just trust that the idea is the, the key or the ticket or, or the proper device. Like, you're like, I gotta give my friends bunch of violence, or I gotta have this on the like, clothesline. On uh, clothesline? Oh. About the music. Oh, oh, oh. On clothesline. Well, the interesting thing that I've learned about working in theater is a collaborative medium. So a lot of times I worked with this, the guy who did the set for that is this Jim Finley. He's an amazingly talented theater artist and his own work and everything. And so we started talking about what I wanted to do and he would throw out ideas because he has the experience with, uh, he makes stages, he, he's, he's built theaters, you know, he knows how to do all that stuff. And so it could have been, Jim that came up with the idea of the close line. And then we developed it from there. But um, a lot of that stuff, that, that's one of the really interesting, like here's a good example for uh, the lectures. I worked with a director and I had never worked with it. Well, not for the very first one because I didn't know what I was doing. But um, now I always work with a director because a director is someone who's outside of you and doesn't know your story and doesn't know Oh, this full piece is so important to me. Well, yeah, maybe, but it doesn't work in a piece. You know, so all of that kind of stuff is, and a director it is especially important now because I'm on stage too. I can't see what's happening. So they're out there figuring it all out. And when we decided, what I didn't show, there's kind of a surprise ending to the piece of the Met. And it's a tableau we want that happens. Um, 
that I had to, I mean, I had the idea of doing it and I made the costumes for it and helped find the people, but it was Jeff Sobel, who was the director, who has the theater chops to know how, and, and Joey Warsaw, who always does my tech stuff, who had, they had the chops to know how to light it. I didn't know how to light it, but they know, theater people know that stuff, you know? They train, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. I mean, not these guys, but you know, it's something that's been developed over a long time, like how to present something and make it powerful to an audience. And um, that's been so amazing to me to see that kind of, and also how collaborative they are. I remember this is something that, um, so when a priest marries a witch, like I said, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just did it with Paul um, and it worked. But then uh, I decided to film it. And so then I had to get like a team together. So I got Laura, who did the lights, to do the lights. I mean, we never did lights before. We just like, it was an auditorium. And then uh, I got, um, who was it that I got? I got somebody else to do, like set up the screen, do the video and everything because we were gonna film it. And, um, and this was a chance to um, rehearse it and to kind of get it, um, I don't know, just, just cut off the rough edges. And I remember the first time we rehearsed it with Paul, uh, Laura and the guy who did the video, who I can't remember who that was, but we finished the, we finished the you know, one run of it and they said, well, I think blah, 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 blah. And the other parts, and I think, I'm thinking, I didn't ask you, why are you, you know, why are you telling me this? You know, but now I've realized that's how they work in theater. You don't have to take their opinion, but everybody just kind of works together to uh, make this collaborative, and it's their job to make what your your idea work. And so they're going to give their opinion, and you want them to give their opinion because they know lighting better than I do. And um, but I remember I was so shocked. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> but uh, but anyway, now I now I. I ask that, you know, if they're not quick enough to give me their opinion, I'll go, well, what do you think? And you don't have to listen to them, but it's, it's, they can see things sometimes you can. Um, can I get a follow up on, on that question? I, I uh, find it really interesting when you talk about theater. Um, I come from like a theater family. Oh. And uh, my mother is a uh, technical theater. Uh -huh. I learned from her thing. My father was a state designer. I was wow. a state designer. He was like the building. Uh -huh. you know? and, and they both like intermingled because they spent their entire life. Right. But uh, you know, the way you talk about it is it feels nostalgic to me. I was like listening to my my mother and my father talk about it. Like, what was his last name? And then they're like, yeah. But they are they also talk about it. Considered it done at all. And you know, it, it just makes me ponder since this is kind of like you said the process is like uh, just pulling things together. How do you know when your production is done? Because I know in theater, it's never done. You just get as much done as you possibly can, and then it's, you know, that's completely time. right. Yeah, it's yeah. just that it's so It's like you gotta scrap your baby, you gotta like kill your baby. Right, you right. Or like you're like, I want this, but I can't. It's the best thing in the world because you have a deadline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And exactly. there's and there's an audience there and you can't do any more about it. So um, is that the end of your work is the deadline? Or well that's when I that's when I a lot of final decisions have to get made. Because there's so many times where you're going, that's where I'm going. Well, I like this and I like this, but there's not enough. I always want my shows to be like no longer than like an hour 10. And um, so things have to get jettisoned. What's gonna go? And uh, a lot of things stay in my shows until the very last minute because I like this and I like that. But at the, you know, when it's showtime, you gotta cut. And sometimes you cut the wrong thing but then you can correct it in the next performance. So, um, but I, I love this idea because I would, I would just keep, you know, I would never make up my mind. 
But the fact that there's a hard deadline, I mean, that happens in gallery shows too. There's a hard deadline, it's gonna open at a certain time. You've gotta decide. And you've gotta decide how you're gonna hang it. You've gotta make all this decision, there's a deadline. The hardest times in my life to get work done was when I didn't have a deadline. Because then you can just work on things forever. You know, there's just like, you can fuss with it endlessly. And then it gets a little depressing because you feel like you can never finish it. So the deadlines um, are great. I mean, even if you end up with something that is not quite what you would have done if you had a little more time, doesn't matter. You did it, it's done, it's great. Then go to the next one. Yeah? Uh, thank you for your speech. Um, I was like trying to find the success in your practice and like try to like manipulate it and thinking like how you interpret it. Um, I found that like uh, through going through third party members, it's like a big one for you, or like uh, resourcing materials through third party, as well as um, your name being from Texas. Um, it's like maybe like another counterpoint. Um, I'm thinking about like how the key spaces like provide you as opportunities surrounding those two topics, and like which one do you think like weighs in more? You know, like a name or like. I, I don't really understand the. So the first thing you said was how do you. You provide like an opportunity to the spaces that you are coming into. So it's like you're not picking up with a team. You just go there and set up shops. So I can see that being like pretty nice for, for how they give you the resources. So mm -hmm. like they're kind of sourcing their own third parties. But then I also thought your name being from Texas, maybe be like. Something to them to like show for. Oh, they don't care about that. No, that they don't care about at all. But the one thing that I, I have noticed about uh, performance places is um, they don't have to commit to you like a, like a gallery commits to you. They're actually showing you for a month, and I, I, I'm talking commercial gallery, but they're showing you. Well, even a museum, they're showing you for usually at least a month. And um, and that costs the money, like rental and all this. And it's a um, it's a bigger commitment. Um, in the performing arts, it can be just their money. You know, they might never have you come back again. I mean, they don't have to commit in the same way that they do in with objects and visual art. Um, you know, they it, it's just not the same. So I, I think it's a lot easier to get um, performing gigs than it is. And also they don't have to think about money because there's no money in it. You know, because there's, uh, they can't sell a performance. They can't, uh, but they can sell a piece of art for a lot of money and then they can resell it. You can't resell a performance. It's not an object that you can uh, monetize in the same way. So there's not that, it's a whole different way of making decisions, a whole different way of performance curators make decisions. And they can be looser about things. Um, but anyway, I was thinking about something else, but I forgot where I was going with that. Does that answer your question? Um, I guess like the follow up would be, uh, you get like block from artists uh, thinking that like you're working in those spaces. Get what? Um, I guess like a cold shoulder being okay. that like you said it's easier. Or it's like not as long. So maybe uh, from artists? From other visual artists you mean or theater artists? Uh, visual arts. No, no, I don't know. I mean, um, everybody's, you know, no, not at all. Yeah. Um, I want to know how you organize your set, which time you're. Oh, God, I would love to know that too. So, that would be wrong. Because you seem to be kind of a director of the nice period that you do. So, you have an idea of we can go to the French project. Can you have a team helping you here, or you can build that team over there? Because it's kind of it's like, it's like a lot of technology, techniques, logistics. Well, every piece is different, but the, the lecture pieces are kind of the same. Um, 
I have to write it and be by myself. And, and the way I organize things is with uh, index cards. And so, and I like the colored ones too. And so, for example, with Farmhouse Warehouse, I, I thought of all the different things, topics that I wanted to deal with in that lecture. So I wanted to deal with back to the land. I wanted to deal with communes. I wanted to deal with um, fantasies about what it means to um, live off the grid. Because thinking about my grandparents and how I was so I romanticized their life, and uh, I wanted to deal with um, French Impressionist painting. And I wanted to deal with the history of the chicken ranch. And I wanted to deal. I mean, so I, I wrote everything on different uh, index cards. And um, and then as I would think of more things, I'd put more index cards. And then I would start researching those topics. And then I would write the bits. Like I'd write the bits about the communes. And then I'd write the bit about whatever, you know, the one. And then I'd start rearranging. Then I'd print out all those pages with a big heading so I knew what it was. Um, and then I'd start arranging those. And um, Usually what I do, but I didn't do it because of the pandemic, is I, when I get something together, I would gather a group of friends and I'd read it for them. And, and, and a lot of times they can give you ideas. They'll say, oh, well, did you know that Charles Fourier was the person who invented the word feminism? You know, whatever. You go, whoa, you know, write that down. And, uh, and, and also when you hear it, and it, it doesn't work when you just read it by yourself in a room. It doesn't work. But when you say it to other people, you hear it in a different way. And all of a sudden, what works and what doesn't work, you just hear it. And um, so that's how those develop. Um, yeah, I guess that's my, that's how I organize index cards. And then I lose the index cards and I can't find them. And then I find some over there. Oh, I forgot those. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk about like when you became interested in all these different mediums? Like, did it, did you become interested in theater like right away? Like, you always knew you wanted to work in that medium, or was it like writing first and research it? Because I, I'm, yeah, but this has been spoken before. But like, your practice is so wide, so broad in all of these different mediums, and it's it's like super inspiring. But I'm so curious about it. I, I really just, I was just like, like that, you know, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, and, and I, and I messed up a lot of times, you know, um, like I remember uh, different friends of mine would say, you need to hire a stage manager. I said, what's a stage manager? And then they tell me, I go, I don't need that. I can do that myself. No, you can't. And, you know, all these kind of things that, that they've developed these ways of, uh, making a, a performance go smoothly, I had to learn the hard way a lot of times. I remember this poor woman, I, I hired her to be a producer for uh, when I did the, the show with Francis McDormand and Bam. Someone said, you gotta have a producer. And I hired her and then for some reason, they had nothing to do with her. I freaked out about hiring her. I thought, Producer, what does that mean? I don't know why. And I said, Oh, I can't hardly, you know, boom. And it had nothing to do with her, but I just was like, I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, but you, you kind of figure it out over, over time. And, um, and there's another part that I didn't mention to this. Uh, around the same time that uh, I did the lecture with Paul. Um, it's weird. All these things kind of happened around the same time, but like in the same year or two. I met Paul. I mean, I, I didn't really know actors so much. I knew a lot of musicians because my husband's a musician, but they're different. And um, uh, I have a friend who's a writer, Jack Haskell, and we decided to have a joint birthday party. And so he invited 20 people and I invited 20 people. And part of his 20 people were Annie B and Paul, and they're a couple that run big dance theater. And we became best friends overnight. And that kind of, and they asked me to do costumes. They were the first people who asked me to do costumes. When I needed someone to perform, 
uh, when a priest married to rich, I knew Paul. I didn't know anybody else, and he did it. So that was kind of kind of a weird thing. The other weird thing that happened was that, oh, and then, you know, the thing about the Danish and then hearing about that, that's another thing. But there's a third thing. And that was, um, we live in one of the last rent stabilized lofts in Soho. We got it years ago through the village boys. And um, I mean, really, that's the only way we could have afforded to live here. And uh, I have three kids. And my husband and I both worked at home. Finally, we got enough money so I could, um, we don't have a big loft. We don't have one of those lofts that you, we have like a small loft. And we got the money so I got a, a studio in Brooklyn. So the area that I thought was gonna, that was my studio, I expected the kids to take it over, but they didn't because I think for years I've been told, get out of my studio, you know, whatever. They, they didn't touch it. And then it became this room in our house that collected crap. Like the guy below us was getting rid of exercise equipment. We're like, oh, we'll take it. You know, it just became like a garage. And you can't have that in New York. You know, the space is too valuable. And so uh, a friend of ours was, uh, he's not, well, he, he's a, he was a dad in the school where our kids go to. And he was in a performance at the public. So we went to it. And it was a theater in the round. And we were waiting for the show to start. And I turned to my husband and I said, you know what we should do with that space? Because I said, you can't have a space like this that's not designated as something. It's designated as an office. It's designated as a, bath, a bathroom or a bedroom, whatever. It's, that's where our problem is. It's not designated as anything. It's just collecting up. Let's make it a theater. He's like, what? I said, yeah, let's make it a theater. And then he thought about it, and he, he had just done an opera, and the set designer had been this guy, this amazingly talented guy, Jim Finley. And he said, I'll call Jim. And nobody had any money at that time. And so we scraped together the money, and Jim, who had never had the time to do this now, got together a bunch of actors. And one summer when we were away, he built this little theater in my studio. Now the stage is like, twice the size of that table. I mean, it's little, but he's so clever. He built it. I, I said, I wanted it like a shaker meeting house. So he built these benches and then he, he didn't do it at all like I thought it would, but it's so clever. And then he built these two platforms and um, so kids could climb up ladders and see the performances. Okay, so we had a theater, now what? So, Paul, who I just met, said, I'll do something. I've always wanted to do this. So he did the first thing. Then this guy who I'd stayed friends with, but not close friends with over the years, we were paralegals together. Um, and he's a dramaturg. He, he studied, he's a playwright and dramaturg. He graduated from Yale uh, graduate program years ago, and he's a professor at the University of Iowa. And Dare comes by, his name's Dare Clark, and he's like, all right. And so he's, he's done Ibsen plays, Beckett plays. He organizes them, he casts them, he directs them. And I have learned so much from watching him. I didn't know Beckett. I didn't know it. I didn't know any of that stuff. And so just watching him put it together and I had to help. And I always get the role of the maid because he's too embarrassed, you know, all the little roles that he's too embarrassed to ask his real actor friends. But I learned so much from that. And that kind of all happened at the same time. But anyway, I know. <laughs> yeah? I wonder, um, do you feel any affiliation or um, kindreds with uh, Sunday in the park with George? by Stephen Sondheim, or, because those are, it's almost the opposite of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. They're taking, right, their theater that they're playwrights taking a painting and turning it into theater. But so they, they start from the theater side. You're starting from the, the but, visual arts side. Um, I, I shouldn't say no. I've never seen Sonny the Barber George, but he's making a story out of it. 
and he's making characters out of it, and he's uh, using his imagination. Uh, I think he's using imagination. I mean, I, I really, I, I try to tell, actually, I remember when I first did When a Priest Marries a Witch, afterwards somebody said, is that a true story? That can't be true. And it's like, yeah, it's true, because I don't have the imagination to make these things up. And, um, but I, I'm assuming that Stephen Sondheim, I mean, because those characters didn't exist, right? Nobody knows who those people are in that painting, but Ron Jacques. So that's completely and totally made up. And, you know, it's a whole different um, follow act. But I, I should watch it. I've never watched it. Similar question. Do you feel any kindredship? That's the word in Hamilton. I was just thinking about re remember and maybe that piece you did at the Park Avenue Armory. And I kept seeing kind of resonances, but also so different in how your work is sort of underwrought in a way, whereas hers is in some ways. That's so funny that you said that because um, that's how I met Anne. She came to Re Remember. And, um, and then she emailed me and said, why don't you come as a visiting artist after Ohio or whatever. And now we're really close friends. Is that like you the Western? What? Did that lead you to the Western? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and um, she's been, oh, she's the nicest person in the world, but also a really, really good artist. And um, so, but that's how it happened. She just, I don't know how she even heard about it, but she came as one of the audience members. And I should ask her how she, she probably won't remember. Um, yeah, that's what happened. Did you see that? Did you go to the Park Avenue Armory? Or? Oh, I love that piece. But the yeah. swings. Uh -huh. and, yeah. uh, and the scribes, and the, I mean, it was just so multi layered. But there's kind of in the way that your work often involves translation from, you know, painting to ballet or mm -hmm. from drawings on a score to a musical score or from mm -hmm. the, the diagrams for weaving into a musical score. Mm -hmm. There's this sort of, in a way, synesthesia I think happens again and again. Or going from one sense to another or one register to another. And she uses a lot of people who are very skilled yeah. um, to, because um, she'll have an idea, but she didn't know how to build it. Like she did this piece that was beautiful at Mass Mocha. I don't know if you ever saw it where the paper would flow down. And so somebody had to build that machine, right? And um, that was a really beautiful piece. And yeah, she's done a lot of great work. But uh, that's how I got to know her. She just happened to show up at that. That's one of the great things about doing uh, these theater pieces. You never know who's in the audience. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. Is so like fascinated by the piece you did at Justin Memorial. Like it makes such sense that a Jacqueline would be like sort of introduced as an instrument. It mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Like it's rhythmic and it's loud. It's like mm -hmm. percussion. So I guess I'm just curious how you sort of made that connection in introducing it as an instrument. Well, it's because I was I was I wasn't just drawing at any. I just showed those two. But I was drawing, I would check out all these books in the library on weaving. And there's all these, you know, so many very weaving traditions. And there's these beautiful old books that are, I think they're probably like from the 20s and 30s. And they would have these like hand done diagrams to show you how to set the loom up. And that's when I, I discovered, like I said, I said, God, this looks like written music. And that's when I asked my husband to sing it for me. And then, so that started percolating in my head that that weaving notation could go directly to, um, to music, could be sung. And then, um, and then I've always loved what those big looms look like. So it just kind of went from there. I didn't, I didn't really know it would sound as cool as it did. Um, I found this guy who's a sound, I don't know if he's a sound engineer or something. And so, um, I asked him to, you know, for the performance to put mics on it. Um, and it ended up sounding really cool. So you like, you 
before that. No, I hadn't, I hadn't heard it before. But I don't think I invented it because after that, someone told me that Stockhausen did it. Do you, do you, I don't know if you know Carl Hans Stockhausen. He's like a, he's deceased now, but he's a very famous drummer and composer. And he did it. He had it as an instrument and he used to do a piece called, I want to say trance or something, but I'm, I'm not really sure about that. But it, it's, you know, probably other people have thought of it too. But, um, it really becomes the heart of the piece but I'm, I'm really relying on people who know what they're doing like the guy Todd who's directing the orchestra and he's hearing everything and trying to shape it and then the guy Einar who is at the uh, controls at the DJ table and they're all kind of contributing their own way and mix everything together. So it's, it's kind of an improvised, it is an improvised piece. But, um, and um, we've recorded it for an album and we're, um, at some point we'll put it out. Um, is that, are we done now? I, mean, I feel like we're talking too long. I think we're done. I think we're done. Thank yeah. you so much.